Good morning, God's Word, my life. I'm getting it after all this time. Last quarter, I kept saying, God's life, my word. <laughs> so I think we've got it now, finally. God's Word, my life. So we're back here. I'm so glad to see you all. It's just great to have you returned, and I see some new faces here as well today. So I think we are in for a really, really wonderful study, and you're going to hear from Dave and all five for the today and for the five weeks following this, Dave Rohr is going to be teaching. So there will be great continuity in that. He will be, of course, introducing what you've got. But do look at, if you came in and got a blue thing, you're going to see where we're headed. Uh, and then the off-white form is what your outline for today so that you can use that to take notes on or whatever there. Also, I hope all of you have signed in. There is a kind of a golden rod, a, this sheet back there when you got your name tag. It's always nice to know who you are. So if you want to wear a name tag, we would love that, and then we'll get used to who you are. You notice I don't have mine. <laughs> Actually, I do. It's down here. There. Well, no, that's my key. Oh, well, I feel... <laughs> Um, anyway, so glad you're here. Thank you for coming. Uh, I also wanted to tell you that there are going to be a few other people here that you will want to get to know, and some of them will be here later today, this morning. Uh, these are the Life Stewardship Initiative team. Uh, we sometimes just call them LSI, and uh, Life Stewardship. This is a group of people that's been meeting for the last about two years, people that are really united in their desire to understand uh, God's purpose and how we might fit into that. And it's a theme that's been playing and kind of sneaking up in a lot of people's hearts right now. And so we are interested as a team of people in helping you explore those things if you are interested. And I think the things that you're going to hear from Dave are going to really uh, bring some things to the surface. And in a, in a way that will help us to uh, follow up on that, we are going to reserve this room several times during the course of the next five weeks to linger afterwards so that we can just maybe regroup in, in little pockets of people and talk about these things that are coming up in our hearts and in our minds as we move on. Um, I also wanted to remind you that there are things to pick up besides that in the back. I've taken a little bit of a, uh, I've, because I got to set up the room today, I had a chance to put out a few things that I really want to make you people aware of too. We're having a wonderful third annual Friends for the Journey dinner coming up on April 29th where Miriam Aidney is going to come in and speak to us uh, and talk to us about the things she's learned about w living in a kingdom without borders. She has had some incredible experiences on five different continents, and she also had a wonderful write-up in Christianity Today, and I've made some copies of that back there. You may have found that. It looks, it's called Heroic Tales, Heroic Tales from Distant Lands, and there's some copies of that back there. Also wanted you to know that uh, on this class is being recorded. It will be recorded each week and it will be posted online sometime about the middle of the week. It also will be available in the library on CD or if you've heard something that just really you just say I, I want that one. You can go and order it from the audio desk which is right out this door. Uh, there's a little window before you go to the garage and there's a place where you can order those. Many ways to keep up with this class. If you don't happen to be here, uh, you know that there's ways to, to know that you didn't miss out because you can catch up. Uh, so that's basically where we are. Let's see, I think I've covered the little things I'm doing. I'm, by the way, am Ann Thomas. Uh, I'm the director of Second Wind, but I also work through community life. Uh, and, and wear a lot of different hats in there. But this is one of my favorite hats to wear, is working in this class, God's Word, My Life. So uh, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much uh, for bringing us back here today. We thank you because we are a community that loves to learn. And, uh, Lord, we know that you have gifted Dave Rohr in such a way that he communicates deep truths of the Bible uh, the things that you have taught him, he will share with us. So, Lord, teach us things today that we didn't know when we came in here. 
and we will expect for you to meet us in new and wonderful ways. We thank you now for this time. In Jesus' strong name, amen. It's a, it's a cleansing bur- ba- uh, breath, you know. It's, I guess, old Lamaze training, even though I didn't have to deliver our children, you know, before you give birth to something, you just... <sighs> so, well, it's good to be with you. I want to spend some time over these next uh, six weeks talking about the theme of, of God's call in our lives. Uh, It's a topic that I have addressed um, many times before, uh, never in the context of the material that I'm bringing to you today. This is the first time I've I've done that. But it's a a theme that um, I think has just had a certain resonance with me as as I've gone through my own uh, Christian life journey and um, tried to figure out this thing called uh, vocation or, or God's call. And so what I I want to do and what I hope to do over these six weeks is to get us to think about what call means and maybe allow um, for a little bit of a redefinition uh, in our minds uh, of of how we deal with this theme and and what we mean when we talk about God's call in our lives. Um, And and the way I want to skew that redefinition right here at the outset is... um, is to say that I I want us to begin to think about call not so much as uh, the matter of of figuring out something and then going in search of a way of acting on it, that is, finding out what my call is, as if it's this kind of static and fixed thing in the universe, like my astrological sign, you know, uh, that this is my call and um, and this is, uh, you know, as if it's, it's so innate to our genetics or our identity. I want to call us away from from that notion of talking about call and rather see it more as uh, an ongoing process of of listening to and hearing and and responding to an an invitation from God. Uh, I think that sometimes when we look at it in the first way, when we begin to talk about it primarily in terms of call in terms of first-person personal pronouns, like my call, uh, when we start to talk about it that way, we're, we talk often about as if God needs us to do something. Uh, and uh, I want us to rather think about what does it look like to, to hear God inviting us to join with him in something. Uh, and I'll say more uh, in the weeks to come about what I mean by that. Um, but that, that call is really more about taking up something that is laid out in front of us by God more than it is searching for something that's congruent with our gifts, skills, or preferences, or, or predilections, you know, that, that it's, it's not this fixed and static thing that, that uh, we know once for all uh, that uh, this is what we're supposed to do. Uh, and so... Um, So I really want to call us into a place where we're thinking about it in a very relational context. Um, That 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 call, even even the the etymology of the word word as we use it, as it as it comes from its its Latin origins, vocare, which means voice. Uh, We get our word vocation from the word vocare, Um, but it's really about listening to and responding to the voice of God. Um, God's call is, is, is not necessarily to a task, uh, it is to a relationship, and uh, tasks are, are a part uh, of that relationship. And so I'm calling this class Picking Up the Cues, uh, Noticing and Participating in the Work of God, and I, I chose that word cue uh, very specifically, um, that... Um, that, that that notion of, of Q is different than clue. Uh, you put the L in there and you've got, a, you've got a context where we're going and searching for all the evidence that we need to figure out who and what we are and then going and applying it, maybe. Um, I'm, I'm rather thinking of it more in terms of the participation in a story, uh, a drama. And when an actor is ready to say his or her lines, they are, they are cued by someone else. 
um, the the person before and 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 after them uh, in the in the storyline are 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 kind of uh, the the ones who are sending the cues. Uh, uh, that uh, that that set our particular lines, our particular part of the story, in the context of this this bigger story of of God's work in the world and and how we're a part of this this bigger story. And so um, I'm going to use a, a portion uh, mainly of Luke's gospel. We're going to make one foray into Mark's gospel, and we'll probably occasionally touch down in John's gospel, um, but. Uh, we are, are looking at the story, as Luke tells it especially, of John the Baptist. Uh, why John the Baptist? Well, because I like him. Uh, uh, but beyond that, uh, Luke is a master storyteller. And uh, Luke kind of, the opening chapters of Luke especially, but really all through Luke and Acts, we have Luke telling this story of God's redemptive work, and he does it in a, in a masterful way. Uh, and I think the way he tells the story, it's very easy for us to identify with and to put ourselves in the story as we identify with the characters of the story. And so that's the reason that um, I'm, I'm choosing um, the character of John the Baptist, because he fits into the, the whole story of Jesus, uh, in a very, very significant way, and the people in his life and that surround him uh, also play a role in in this story. And and so as we as we look at John's life and death, and Jesus comments um, uh, on on John's life, um, we we get the opportunity um, to to kind of see what it means to to take normal kind of everyday stories of people's lives and to see how they fit into this big, big drama of salvation uh, that God is working out. Uh, Luke uh, gives us a lot more detail uh, and drama than the other gospel writers in, in many things, and we're going we're gonna to move into Mark's gospel to talk about the death of John the Baptist because Mark does the best job of giving us drama um, on that one. Um, but the, the play that we're going to spend most of our time in Luke and the play that, that Luke is writing has spaces for us to I, identify with the characters. And so that's why we're, um, we're looking at that. And, and John's part in this story, John the Baptist's part in this story is especially instructive. There's, there's a, a really big thing going on and we're told from the outset that John is going to be a part of it, that that as people are going about their daily lives and the divine story is in the process of breaking into their story and they're at varying levels of discovering this or, or not discovering it, they realize either that they're a part of something much bigger than what they were expecting to be a part of or they're living in, in fear of connecting with that and, and, and walking away from any acknowledgement that their stories might be a part of a, of a story bigger than the one that they're writing for themselves. And so in the mundane kind of normalcy of their lives, um, we find the context for the inbreaking of, of God's story. The other reason I'm, I'm choosing John the Baptist is that I'm working, and I have been working really for the, with the last four, for the last four years on, on this material in Luke um, uh, uh, about John the Baptist, uh, it's material that I've used, um, not this that I'm teaching, but the texts, uh, some of the texts that I'm teaching, um, has, has also informed some work that I've done with our interns here on a theology of ministry. And that material has now been uh, accepted uh, by InterVarsity Press for a book. And so I'm getting the opportunity to kind of be immersed in these texts at the same time that I'm writing this book. Um, and so you're helping me uh, to stay focused on the book, even though I'm also able to teach uh, with you <laughs> at this time. So, uh, so I'm just trying to be efficient uh, in what I'm doing. <laughs> so there are all sorts of reasons uh, for John the Baptist uh, uh, to be at the, at the core of this. Um, I have in my office, and I'll just tell you right up, up front, that... Um, Art Ware, who was a missionary from our congregation, I don't know whether you remember, he went to Albania years ago, but when he came back from Albania, and Albania was crazy when he was there, he was like 
dodging bullets and down on the floor of his hotel room uh, avoiding tank mortar fire um, at the time that he was there. Uh, not the whole time, but some of it. Uh, but he brought back for me uh, an icon, an Orthodox icon of John the Baptist. It was the first time I'd ever seen, um, uh, seen, uh, you know, I'd seen icons before, but it was the first time someone actually explained to me what they're for and, and why the Orthodox branch, the Eastern branch of the Christian church uh, is, is, makes use of them in a particular way. And the, the, the icon is St. Is John the Forerunner, uh, as it's, it's called, the Greek translation of it, St. John the Forerunner, and, and, or the English translation of the Greek. And um, it, it, this particular icon is just John um, with his head kind of tilted to the side like this and his hands going like this. Um, the, the thing about an, an icon is that it's never kind of an end in itself. It's never supposed to take your eyes. Your eyes are not supposed to rest simply on the icon. The icon is supposed to take you through, through itself to something bigger than itself. And so John is obviously pointing to something in this icon, that he is directing our attention to someone other than himself. Does it sound familiar to his story? <laughs> Uh, It's the perfect example of John understanding his place in the story. So he must increase, I must decrease is the right way the the quote is in John's gospel. Uh, But the other thing that's interesting about this icon is that in in Orthodox churches, it's a part of a a series of three icons usually that are called the grandeses. John the Baptist on one side, Mary the mother of Jesus on one side, making a similar kind of motion uh, uh, to... uh, you know, in, inward, and then the resurrected Christ in the middle looking straight uh, at the worshiper. And, and so Mary and John are, are interceding on behalf of the saints for uh, salvation uh, to, uh, to the resurrected Christ. And so that's the, that's the, the context of, of one of the things that I love about um, uh, John the Baptist and, and someone, um, someone hearing me teach on John the Baptist actually even commissioned uh, an iconographer to um, to write me. They don't call it painting, even though it is painting, but to write me an icon of of, um, of John Saint John the Forerunner. So I have my my very own real painted one now in my office. Um, but um, that's just an aside. It it kind of tells you a little bit personally what is going on with me and and with John the Baptist, and um, and why I'm I'm choosing to focus attention on him here. Um, but, but this class is really about listening to what John is inviting everyone to listen to. Uh, and that is uh, to pay attention to the, to the holy invitations, uh, to, the, to the holy presence, uh, to the ways in which God is showing up, um, and, uh, and then picking that up and, and choosing to be a part of it. And so we're wanting to work with how can we, by paying attention to the experience of of these saints in in these chapters in Luke, how can we learn about the dynamics of our our own relationship with God? And you can see we've got six weeks here, uh, and we'll start today with Zechariah, John's John's father, uh, and the story of Gabriel's uh, appearance uh, to to Zechariah and the announcement of John's birth. We'll move next week to the story of Elizabeth, John's mother, and um, talk about the, um, the attitude of, of openness uh, and uh, how she teaches us about uh, seeing and, and kind of uh, resting in um, her part in the story. Then we're going to take two weeks and look at John himself. Uh, we're going to uh, chew on his fiery sermon in chapter 3. Uh, and uh, then uh, look at his own experience of doubt um, and confusion to some extent. Am I, have I picked up the right story, in other words, um, that he asks himself the question of that from prison? And uh, then we're going to skip um, over to Mark's gospel and look at the story of, of John's death, but more with a view to what does it mean to be one who chooses to avoid or not pick up the story, not pick up the cues, um, or to avoid them, maybe how to have picked them up and run from them. That's certainly Herod's story. Uh, there's some uh, 
just lovely drama uh, in this story. Um, and uh, uh, it will be fun to uh, engage that together. And then finally, uh, Jesus' words about John and to the crowd uh, surrounding um, him on the day that, that John's disciples come to ask Jesus uh, that poignant question in um, the earlier part of the Luke 7 text. So um, those are the, um, the broad outlines of, of where we're going. And um, if you like reading ahead, then um, you've got that in, in place uh, in order to do that. With that 20-minute introduction... Um, Let's proceed uh, to looking at our text for today. We're, we're going to look at, at Luke 1, verses 5 to 25. And I'm going to read the, the whole text for us. So just listen to this and, um, and, and listen for the ways in which uh, God encounters uh, and surprises Zechariah. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord, but they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were getting on in years. Once when Zechariah was serving as priest before God and his section was on duty, He was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and offer incense. Now at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, He will go before him to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know that this is so? For I am an old man and my wife is getting on in years. And the angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you to this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute, unable to speak until the day these things occur. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering uh, at his delay in the sanctuary. When he did come out, he could not speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He kept motioning to them and remained unable to speak. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. And for five months, she remained in seclusion. And she said, this is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace I have endured among my people. There's just all sorts of really rich stuff in this text, and and I'm going to land a few places in it um, over these next minutes, and and call some some things out of it to make the points that that I'm I'm wanting us to look at today. But there's far more that could be said of this text than I will probably pick up um, in these minutes. Um, the the first thing that I want to talk about that I I think we might miss in this story is that. Uh, if we're looking for a divine encounter, uh, more often than not, um, we, we find it not because we have set up the circumstances for it to happen, but because we are in the midst of the everyday uh, kind of regularities of our lives and, and God uh, suddenly um, is made known to us. Um, 
whether because of our attentiveness or, or God's insistence, um, at that moment what is always true becomes true in our own consciousness and, and in that everyday moment we encounter God. And, and what we realize um, often uh, as a result of these encounters is that the story that we write for ourselves and the story that, that God is writing um, may have some, some different points of emphasis. And, um, and what, uh, what is true is that our story uh, always fits into his, um, but his story might not always be a part of ours uh, in terms of the way we've written it. And so uh, Zachariah and Elizabeth are the characters, um, the human characters in this story who, um, who are of most interest to us today. Um, they had been writing a story for themselves, and it was a story to some extent of disappointment and loss. Uh, it was a story of childlessness, and uh, in that particular culture, the, the shame uh, for Elizabeth that, uh, that is the result uh, of that child, uh, childlessness, um, that, uh, that a, a, a woman who could not conceive, um, you know, was someone who felt shame because she could not carry on the man's seed. Um, and that was a way of perpetuity. That was a way of, 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 of continuing uh, the story was, was through your children. And, uh, of course, we know now um, genetically that we shouldn't um, just blame women for this. Uh, and, um, uh, but that's what was happening then. And, uh, and so uh, Elizabeth is, is suffering the shame of that. I, I assume to some extent Zechariah is suffering the, the loneliness and the, the, um, uh, the loss of that uh, as well in, in his own way, in that absence of perpetuity that, that his name would not be um, carried on. Um, the interesting thing about this story is, of course, that the, the son who is born to them also does not carry on his name, <laughs> but takes the name that God gives him, uh, and Zechariah has to assent to that as well. So there is a, there is a bit of a loss in, in the participation in this story. It's the reminder that, that no child is my child, um, that, uh, that, that all children that, that we bear are, are gifts to us uh, from God and, and to be respected in their, uh, their own right and not, uh, not just uh, meant to abide by the stories that we write for them, that they, they involve themselves in something bigger than, than what we can plan for them uh, ourselves as parents. And so, um, so uh, I, I look at their, their story, and, and there is in that uh, in some way, a, I think, a resonance for all of us um, and when we come to that point in life when we say, okay, so the way we've, we thought things would work themselves out is not going to be the way they're going to work themselves out. Zachariah and, and Elizabeth had obviously come to this point. Um, you know, uh, they ended up in a place that they, they didn't think they necessarily would occupy. And, um, and when we come to that place where we never thought we would be, um, you know, there, there is the opportunity set up at that moment for an alteration of our expectation. Um, and, uh, and sometimes the alterations of our expectations and our disappointments uh, that, that grow out of those missed expectations or unmet expectations uh, can be the embodiment of a holy invitation. Oh, the story is not going to be what we thought it was What's it going to be? And so God breaks into their story, and, uh, and he, he does so at a time that, that of course, is in the temple and in, and in some ways is a holy moment. But I think as we unpack this text, we also see that it's, it's kind of God breaking in in the context of the, of the mundane. Um, Zechariah, I love the way Luke put it, puts it, uh, his, his section is on duty. Um, you know, it was ever there a bureaucratic statement made about the church. Uh, you know, uh, his section was on duty. I mean, there were 18, I think, no, 24 um, units or sections of the Aaronic priesthood, okay? And, and according to I. Howard Marshall, at least, at this time, there were about 18,000 
Aaronic priests. So do the math, divide that by 24, and you've got the number of priests who are in each section or on duty. And they all had sort of periods in residence in the temple. Um, This is the second temple. Um, This is Herod's temple. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's not the, the first temple, Solomon's temple. That was destroyed by the Babylonians. The Herod's temple was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. Uh, but this is, this is what they call the period of Second Temple Judaism. Uh, and um, uh, so, so first century and, and a little bit before that. Um, and um, so you have these priests who, who kind of come into Jerusalem and in order to kind of do their period of service. It's sort of their gig, uh, you know, and uh, it's just kind of a normal day uh, in the temple, if you will. Um, the incense offering, um, there's, so there's this, this kind of interesting mixture of sublime and mundane in this that a, that a priest would deal with. Um, so on the one hand, we have to kind of see that Zechariah is sort of going through the motions, but on the other hand, he's also been asked to go into the holy place to offer the incense offering, which is something that he wouldn't get to do very often and maybe just once in his life. It used to be something that only the high priest would do, um, but um, I guess because you had so many priests, they kind of wanted to just, just distribute it around a bit. And, uh, but maybe once in his life, maybe more, he'd get the opportunity to be the presiding priest at the incense offering. What's the incense offering? Well, it's, incense is a sign of prayer. It's a sign of God... Um, uh, of people offering their prayers uh, to God. And, um, and the incense offering was offered before the burnt offering in the morning and after the burnt offering in the evening. So there were burnt offerings morning and evening. This is the killing of an animal and the, the burning of it uh, on the altar. The incense altar was a separate thing. It was covered in gold. And uh, it was a symbol of sort of this preparatory prayer asking um, for God's favor. So... Um, so the people outside, they're not actually watching Zechariah do what he's doing. They're outside uh, waiting. And the liturgy, uh, according to one scholar, that the people are praying uh, at this point is, may the merciful God enter the holy place and accept with favor the offering of his people. So the, the people are praying this invocation for the appearance of God on the outside. Zechariah is offering the incense, which is this, this, this offering of, of uh, availability uh, to God. And, um, and so in some ways, it's a normal day. It's something that happens every day that, that these burnt offerings are, are offered. It's, it's the kind of religious ritual that, you know, I'm sure we can name any number of, of instances of, of how we can just kind of go through our lives uh, as, as Christians and kind of enter the sanctuary and, and know that things are going to kind of work out the way they work out. And, um, we may or may not be attentive to any sort of unique moment, um, uh, even though that is a, a moment of holiness. Um, always, and always God is present, but sometimes we become more aware of that presence, and this was certainly the case uh, with Zechariah on this particular day. Um, and, and so on this normal day, uh, God breaks in and, and says through Gabriel, Zechariah, your prayer has been answered. Well, the content of Zechariah's prayer is not clear to us. We don't know what he was praying for. Uh, But this answer that God brings through Gabriel seems to have more to do with a confirmation of relationship than with the granting of a wish. This is not the genie appearing from the bottle, okay, and granting the wish of Zechariah. This is an angel breaking into time and space and saying, your prayer has been answered. And and what we need to note is, is that sometimes prayers that get answered are not the prayers we've been praying. <laughs> um, God answers what God wants to answer. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that's uh, part of what's going on here as well. I think the more important thing about Gabriel's appearance, it is God saying to Zechariah, I am here. Um, I am with you. I am engaged and active in your story, and your story will converge with my story because uh, you're, you and Elizabeth are going to have a son. I, the point I want to make about this is the mountaintop is not the only place for divine invitations. Um, we th- think we're only going to hear from God when we put ourselves in this deeply spiritual place. Um, 
You know, it's often when we least expect it that, that we hear from God. And actually, all the places that we would ever uh, be would, would have to be uh, deemed holy places, if you, if you want to know the truth of it, um, because God, God can greet us in, in any one of those places in our lives. And, and uh, the, the, the key is uh, to not worry too much about putting ourselves in a holy place in order to, to hear the voice of God, but the key is, is being awake to the things that are being put in front of us um, in, in the moment. Now, I had an experience of this when I was a senior in college. Um, I call this the, the I-405 factor. Uh, you know, uh, it has become a holy place for me in the San Fernando Valley because I felt encountered by God uh, uh, driving in my 63 Chevy pickup uh, toward church one Sunday um, through the San Fernando Valley. Um, I had, uh, I was coming close to graduation. It was probably close to this time of year. Uh, so in the third quarter of my senior year, um, I had decided that after, after taking about two-thirds of the law school admission test on a sunny day, I got up from taking that test and said, you know, why do I think I want to spend the rest of my life working with these questions? <laughs> <laughs> and so I got up and... Um, filled in the rest of the bubbles, got up and left. Uh, and um, this was a couple months before this, this springtime. But I decided not to go to law school in, in that particular year. I was going to work for a year and then decide during that year between law school and seminary. And, um, and so uh, I, had, um, I had a job lined up. I was going to be a meter reader for Southern California Edison. Maybe some of you have heard this story. Um, and um, I had to take this little thing called the clerical exam, which was this five-minute alphabetizing numeric thing that I won't go into the details. But um, I thought I was doing pretty well on it and passed it in. Uh, the employment counselor calls me in. Uh, the hiring officer calls me in and says, I'm sorry, you didn't pass the test. Uh, so you won't be able to, you know, um, you, you, you won't be able to move through the... I already had the job lined up, so he said, yeah, we can't give you the job, I'm sorry. Um, uh, I said, well, I, I heard some of those other people can take it again in 90 days, and he said, oh, no, no, you can't take it again for five years. <laughs> uh, so at that point, my plans had fallen through. Uh, my expectations for my life and what I was going to do this next year uh, were not going to come to be, and... and, and I kind of walked away from that meeting uh, laughing a little bit, just thinking, I can't believe it. I'm graduating with honors um, uh, in political science and history from UCLA, and I can't pass a five-minute clerical test. Um, <laughs> there must be something going on here that is bigger than me. And so I'm driving to church one Sunday on the 405, and I just kind of hear God say to me, and I don't hear God say much to me. I, there have been a couple of times in my life where I, I could identify that, maybe three. And um, I'm not going to tell you what the other two were. But, um, <laughs> but this was one of them where, he, where I just felt God say, why don't you just go to seminary? You know, and I kind of began to chew on that. I was driving, you know, my pickup truck and headed to church. Why don't you just go to seminary? I thought, well, you can't get into law school quickly, but you can get into seminary quickly. They're always looking for students. Um, <laughs> so I did. Not a very dramatic call to ministry. <laughs> In fact, I didn't think of it as a call to ministry at all at the moment that I, that I heard that. I just kind of thought, wow, hmm, this is interesting. And so I applied and was accepted and spent the first year in what was ended up being the wrong seminary and then uh, transferred to what became the right seminary for me. And it is for me just a, an example of this way in which uh, the invitations can hit us at places that we wouldn't normally expect them to hit us. Uh, and that the, the reality of that is to, I think, to, to maintain a kind of humility to the fact that that any moment, uh, because every moment has to do with the living God, that any moment uh, could be a moment where we're more in touch with that divine encounter and, and divine presence. And so our response to these holy invitations um, is, is the next thing I want to deal with in this text, because um, the, the content of Gabriel's invitation to Zechariah is, is instructive. 
And I think it's good for us to look at because there's some things that are generally true about these holy invitations, these divine invitations to us that I think come through in this story in particular and some kind of generalizations we can draw about the way um, God, God works in our lives um, and when he invites us to, to participate um, in this bigger story. Um, and, and what Gabriel essentially does is he says, here's how your life Zechariah is going to fit into the kingdom context. I want to give you a window in terms of the meaning of your life as, as God views it. Um, a child is going to be born to you, and your expectation is going to be violated. Your expectation of childlessness is going to be violated. But that's, that's joyous news on the one hand, um, in that and a hardship will be alleviated and, and pain at, at, at one point is going to be taken away. But this child... Um, will also be a part of the story. And it's not just your story in getting what you want or what you thought you wanted. This child has a part in the story as well, and this child is going to be a prophet, um, that he will be in a line that is quite ancient and, and, and a part of a story that's very old. He will, he will serve in the spirit of Elijah. And if I was to paraphrase what, what Gabriel announces to John, I would paraphrase it in this way. Zechariah you and your wife Elizabeth will play a role in my story, says God, that you have not imagined playing. The two of you are going to have a baby boy. I am going to dispossess you of your expectations of childlessness and alter the course you have set out for yourselves. I'm going to bring joy into your lives and ask you to steward the life of this servant of mine to whom you will give birth. For your child will be a prophet. Like Elijah, he will continue the work of issuing my invitation to my people. He will call them to turn toward me and allow their covenant relationship with me to be the foundation of all their relationships. He will point people in my direction and invite them to expect me to be a significant part of their lives. What I find fascinating about Gabriel's announcement to Zechariah is that there's no permission asking here. It's just, this is the story that's going to take place. This is how it's going to fit into the divine plan, period. Um, Zechariah doesn't need to say yes or no to this. He doesn't need to take it up in any way. You know, he doesn't need to start start saving for prophet school, you know. Uh, um, And... It's simply the announcement, your life fits into God's plan. Your life is a part of the story. Your son is going to play a role in salvation history, as will you, and that will be significant. So watch for that. Rest in that, because here's how it all fits. And so Zechariah comes back with, should I trust this? Um, And that's something that happens often when we're in the midst of receiving a word from God, is that it freaks us out. Um, It seems abnormal to some extent. And so he asks, you know, how will I know that this is so? And and so you know what's happening here. Gabriel doesn't really ask for permission, but he's rather informing Zechariah of the divine meaning of the events that are going to take place, and this is how you'll fit into God's story, Zechariah. And so Zechariah's response is very instructive. How will I know? What guarantee can you give me that that I can trust this. Can you, can you kind of give me something to go with here? Because I'd, I'd like to rest in this, but I'm not sure I can. Um, and Gabriel's response is equally instructive. Um, he essentially says, your trust is not what is at issue. The story will work itself out whether you trust it or not. You know, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I've got some other people to visit today, and I don't have time. (laughs) God is at work, and this is what's happening, and here's what it means, so watch for it. In short, Gabriel says, shut up and watch. Pay attention. This isn't really about guarantees and making sure you feel safe enough to buy in, because your buy-in doesn't matter here. It's just going to happen. And you can recognize its divine significance or not. That's the choice. The choice isn't to leave Elizabeth 
and not make love to her so that she won't get present pregnant just to spite God. There's evidence that God can take care of that as well. All right? That would be an absurd choice on, on Zachariah's part, right? Why would he do that? I can't imagine him doing that. So, um, you know, there really isn't a risk here on his part at this moment. And we always think about the call of God as this, you know, is sort of inviting us to, you know, be a pioneer missionary down some uncharted river somewhere where natives are going to be, you know, blowing darts at us uh, through the trees, you know, that, that it's always about risk. Um, this is not really about risk at this point. The risk that Zechariah has to take is to just trust whether or not what he just heard is really the divine story. Is this really the divine story? Am I really a part of this story? And he's, he's going to find out in time whether or not he is and, and how, this, how this all works out. And that's what Gabriel tells him. So let the story play out. And notice that the story does play out. Zechariah finishes his term of service and goes home. Elizabeth becomes pregnant. And what is affirmed here is the truth that Zechariah needed some guarantee about. He wanted to know, is my life really a part of what you are doing in the world, God? And God says, yes, it is. And as the story begins to play out, as Gabriel said it would, Zechariah begins to warm up. And so what's necessary at the point of encounter, and notice that that Mary, if you want to read on to to the rest of chapter 1 and Gabriel's uh, announcement to Mary, Mary's got some doubts too. Uh, but she doesn't get struck dumb, <laughs> you know. Um, I'm not sure what's up with that. Uh, uh, but uh, Zechariah is the one that with whom Gabriel gets impatient. Um, but the, the call at this point to us, I think, in the moment of that encounter is humility. You know, Earl used to, to, to talk about... Uh, he, Earl was not much of a mystic, as you remember. Um, you know, he... Uh, he, he uh, but when he said when there's, a, when there's a divine encounter that seems a little abnormal, a little paranormal, um, you have to kind of sit back and say, one wonders. There's a, there's a, a, a humility in that line. It's, it's not something to be rejected, maybe not something I can fully yet abra- embrace, but I'm going to be humble in, in the midst of this encounter. And I think that's what, Z- the, what Gabriel calls Zechariah to. Um, It will become clear, so don't get too invested in denying it or fighting it or avoiding it or trying to make it happen or making sure that you're okay believing it. Let it be. Let it happen. (laughs) You know, there, there are all sorts of stories about people, you know, sort of reading divine encounter or actions into things and then making their lives about trying to make it happen. Um, I heard a radio story a couple of years ago about a group of people in Texas who are breeding these red cows that are mentioned in the book of Revelation to repopulate uh, Israel and Palestine with these red cows to hasten the return of Jesus. That's not our part uh, in the story. All right? Um, it's not like we can manipulate the facts of Scripture to achieve what what needs to be achieved in the time that we want it achieved. God doesn't need our help with that. Um, God didn't need, I believe, Zechariah's belief at this moment um, to begin to work out and to carry on his story. So it's not about manipulating anything. It's about humbly living into the expectancy that Things in my life fit with a scheme that's bigger than the one that I've sketched out for myself. And that takes humility. And it takes talking about call in terms of something bigger than my call. Well, God, my call is this, and so because it's my call, um, I need to act on it in this way. So please set things in motion so I can act on my call in my way at this time. I don't think it works that way. Uh, and certainly it doesn't work that way in, in this particular story. 
Um, and Zechariah is the one who's saying, essentially, or from his perspective, I, I may or may not know how this is so, but I can humbly assume that God is at work and that I'm a part of that work. That's the challenge that's issued to Zechariah at this point. Are, are you going to humbly receive this and let it happen, uh, understanding that it's the work of God? Um, are you going to live in skepticism about it until it does happen and then you can understand it? Or are you going to run from it because you're absolutely afraid of it and you don't want it to happen? You know, there's a, the story in Greek, Greek drama, Greek tragedy about Oedipus, the king, who is, uh, whose mother and father are told that, uh, that uh, he, will, um, he will be born to them, he will kill his father and marry his mother. Um, and, uh, and so they send him away to some mountain after he's born to try and keep it from happening. And, of course, in Greek tragedy it always happens, so it happens. He comes back, he kills his father, he marries his mother, and then realizes that um, he's committed incest and, you know, gouges his eyes out. Uh, it's just a happy tale. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, they're, they're, but the, it's the same kind of thing about the, the ridiculousness of, of trying to, to figure it out and control the way that, that God's story is, is going to work. The, the Greek version of it is about fate. I don't think that's the Christian version of it. The Christian version of it is more of a story of saying, here's the story. Here's the, here's the broad and open space that I've opened up for you. Uh, do you want to dwell in it in gratitude for what I've given? Or do you want to live in ignorance of, of how you fit in, into this bigger picture and how I've invited you into this broad and open space? That's the Christian version of the story. And I, th- I think we've got that present uh, in this text. So humility is the aspect that we want to talk about uh, and conclude with today, um, this invitation to shut up and watch, that, that something more than what I expect may be going on here. And so those notions of expectancy and humility call us to pray prayers that, that try to be attentive to how God has shown up, like the prayer of examine, if you're familiar with that, where at the end of the day, you simply reflect on two questions. Um, Lord, how did I experience your presence and love today? How did I experience the absence um, uh, of your presence and the absence of your love? to recount those two things in your own mind and just being aware of, of, of in what way was the day filled with divine invitations and which of those did you notice and, and which of those did you not. Um, or a simple prayer that I pray all the time, Lord, how are you at work here and how can I be a part of it? Um, the, the, the humility of that prayer is simply, I know you're up to something. I may or may not uh, have a part in that with this particular person, uh, but if I do, and if I can, show me. Uh, you know, Mary responds um, to Gabriel as well. And she says uh, to him after initially questioning his word to her that, that, uh, that she's going to bear Jesus. She, she initially questions that, and then she says, okay, let it be unto me as you have said. Let's go with this. What else can I do? Um, there's, a, there's a kind of openness in that remark. It's an openness that we also see in Elizabeth um, as uh, we deal with her next week. And so um, if you want to read ahead, just read the rest of, of chapter 1, and you'll get those, um, those texts uh, under your belt before next week. So let's uh, stop here for today. And uh, do you have any, any questions or, or comments that um, you want to make? Yes. Um, the struck dumb part. Um, what do you mean, what about it? Well, um, it wasn't up to him or not, but, but there was a consequence. There was a consequence, right. Um, I, I think at, at some level... Zachariah is given a gift at that point. There's a gift in silence at that point. And who knows, you know, if, if his question to, uh, 
to Gabriel is any indication of, of his personality type, maybe it's a gift to Elizabeth as well. <laughs> um, it, it is... Uh, it is, I, I don't see these things as punitive as they appear. I mean, it's very harsh. Um, but I don't, I don't see that, that silence as, as punitive um, in this text. Um, and I, I like the, the notion of, of encapsulated in it, just as I've said, is shut up and watch. Um, I think there's an invitation to behold, um, to behold the holiness there, um, to, to be quiet and, and let it and, and let yourself be encountered. Um, and um, I, I see a spiritual director. She happens to be an, uh, a nun, actually. And uh, one of the things that she says to me often is, it uh, gets me to ask the question is, where, where is the divine invitation? Where is the holy invitation here? And it's, it's been language that I have taken on since, um, since meeting with her uh, that I... I very much appreciate because um, I think that we we tend to be people who want to figure it out and then go after it, um, but and sometimes we need to wait for an invitation. <laughs> and um, and so uh, there's a uh, there's an invitation to I think rest in that silence as well. Um, so I don't think I'm totally spinning it, you know, in a kind of merry sunshine way. Um, uh, but uh, I like the phrase "shut up and watch," and you know, you you kind of want to you you kind of want to uh, know a little bit more about Gabriel. Uh, I mean, he's he's featured in a lot of these Annunciation icons. He's been someone that iconographers have have loved to paint as well. So that's 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 maybe all I should say about that at this point. Yeah, Pam. The thing that I was thinking as you were reading that story about that very component of this uh, was remembering the witness that shared at Easter, who was talking about after his stroke, what it really called him to was listening. And so I would almost see it as shut up and listen. Because in a sense, it's about, I, I think, maybe if he had been listening in general, Something that Russell said that I don't know whether he said it in the witness, but I, he said it in our conversation as we were preparing for it. Um, he said part of the gift of the silence um, was growing into the awareness that um, that my presence was more valuable uh, than uh, than merely. Um, the, the expertise that I might bring to a situation, Do you know that um, it was there was a grace uh, there was a grace in the silence for him in that uh, God let him know that he had value apart from his kind of high functioning uh, high paced uh, medical oncology uh, hematology practice that you know where he was always the expert um, and then suddenly he couldn't speak and uh, found himself um, useless on the one hand, but then understanding that the value was in his presence. The irony um, of, of, that, of that little window is the, the arrogance of not seeing the obvious. I mean, I'm Gabriel, why would you doubt? And in our lives, we often go through life not seeing the bigger picture. We don't see God at work in our lives. When it is so obvious, a fool has said in talk of God, you have, to be, you have to be an idiot not to believe me. I'm Gabriel. What God is doing in our lives, day in and day out, when it is, you know, how could they not be a God? We miss it, though. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing how much we do, yes. Yeah, George. You're more like Abraham and Sarah. Yeah. He, they even laughed. Oh, right. And, I, and we're going to talk about Sarah next week, as a matter of fact, because I think Elizabeth's story is also Sarah's story. And Luke is very much in touch with Old Testament uh, traditions when he uh, puts this together for us masterfully. But, but the, the whole notion of Sarah laughing is very, very similar to Elizabeth's response. So let's stop there. See you next time.